Good evening. This is Children First. It's a program presented by Maryville Academy, and my name is Sister Catherine Ryan. I'm privileged to be the Executive Director of Maryville Academy, and tonight I am delighted that our guest is Mary Mitchell. And in one moment, I'm going to invite Mary to be sharing her story and telling us uh, some of the, I think, great experiences that she's had. But I would just like to begin by saying that when we are working with our children, we want to be sure to hear their dreams and encourage their dreams. And I think what we're going to hear tonight from Mary Mitchell is how someone, Mary, had her dreams and worked hard for those dreams and achieved her dreams and let this be a model for our children. So for parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts who are listening to this story, uh, please think about how we can make this possible for our children as well. So Mary Mitchell, I'm so delighted you're here this evening. Thank you for inviting me. And Mary, would you start off by telling us a little bit about uh, your family? Well, you know, I have uh, adult children now, uh, and I come from a, a very large family. Uh, I had nine uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, my, my parents raised ten children in their household. I have an identical twin sister. I have twin mm -hmm. brothers. Uh, and I grew up on the south side of Chicago in what used to be Clarence Darrell Holmes. Let me take you back just a little bit further, Mary. Mm -hmm. You were born in Mississippi? Born in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Don't remember much about Clarksdale. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what I do uh, remember about it, you know, is uh, fading fast, you know. Sure. Uh, most of my experiences started, uh, that I remember, started in Chicago on the west side. And so you, your first memories or strongest memories are from those early years with your family. And so there were 10 of you that your ten, parents, ten your dear us. parents were yes. uh, caring for 10 of you? Yeah, we, we you know, um, that was like at a time when uh, African-American families were very large, you know. Today, you don't, you hardly see that. Uh, none of my brothers and sisters have that many children. You know, most of us have two kids or one child or, or you know, three children at the most. But in those days, uh, when my parents, and they came from the South, uh, they had children, fam you know, children were blessing. And so there were a lot of us. Uh, and I grew up in a household with uh, uh, six brothers, four, if there, there were six boys and four girls. So, so that our listeners know that this is a family that they can relate to, because children are still a blessing, of course, right, uh, right. but we have less of them yes. uh, in one family. Uh, what was your, your childhood like? What, what school did you go to? What did you study? What did you think when you were a child that you wanted to do? Well, you, you know, I, when I was growing up, uh, we lived in a housing project. And for most people, and a lot of people know this, that you know, there were many opportunities when you grew up in an environment of poverty, uh, and when you have uh, concentrated poverty, poverty, meaning that you have so many uh, children and families that are in dire need, uh, and few role models in terms of people who are successful, that there are lots of opportunities for trouble. I, uh, however, avoided a lot of trouble by going to the library, ah. and I found my escape in books. I mean, that's what, you, you take me to the library, I read an autobiography in a moment, and I just wanted to um, travel the world through books. That's how, that's how I did it, you know. I learned about Europe, I learned about Africa, I learned about, you know, South America. I learned about the, the uh, heroes of, of my generation, uh, people like Althea Gibson, who was a, um, a, a tennis player. Mm -hmm. I, I learned about that through books. That kept me off the street. That kept me out of trouble. And I, I think that, you know, I always want, I always loved words. Uh, I always loved uh, reading stories and telling stories. And so I think that that has a lot to do with how I became a writer. Okay. And when, when you were uh, going to the library, some adult must have been helping encourage you to do that. Um, mm, you know, I, I don't think so. My mother was illiterate. Uh, my mother couldn't read. I used to sit down and I used to write letters for her. And uh, she would, when she wanted to write to someone in the South, she would sit down and dictate the letter and I would uh, write it for her and I would go to the mailbox and mail it. So it wasn't that uh, they encouraged me. All they knew was that they wanted me to have a better opportunity than they had. And they saw that opportunity as education. If you go to school, they believed in their heart that if you went to school, you studied hard, you'd get a job, and you'd be better off than they were when they were in the South uh, as picking cotton and, you know, working for, uh, on a plantation. 
So I, I'd like to emphasize one, uh, one of the parts of what you're saying, Mary, uh, how important it is that we support our children in their education, that we uh, encourage them to realize that this is an investment in their future, and we uh, help them, maybe encourage them to study, uh, help them get their homework done, uh, because we believe that what they're doing is really going to make their lives better and our society lives better. All right. Well, you know, I've never bought into the excuse that because uh, young parents are young or they're low income and maybe they didn't finish their own education, that they don't have dreams and aspirations for their own children. Uh, my mother couldn't read, but you know what? And she couldn't help me with my homework. She couldn't do the math. She couldn't mm -hmm. do any of those things, but she knew that it was important that I did it. You know, she knew that it was important for me to have a place to sit down and write and work. She knew that it was important for me to read books. And, and when I wanted to read to her, she would allow me to read to her. When I wanted to go to my father and uh, tell him about my, my what story I had read or what math problem I had worked on or what I had learned in school, no matter how tired he was, and he was a tired man, he, was, he had 10 kids and he was working two jobs and a job on Saturday, he would take the time to listen to my, my, my stories or, you know, we would make up, um, we would do little puppet shows for my younger brothers and sisters who make up the dialogue. He took the time to listen to that. And I think that parents today, we underestimate them. Uh, too often we think that parents aren't good parents because they didn't get their own education. Well, you know what? Even the worst of parents want better for their children. Mm-hmm. You know, they may not know how to give their children a better opportunity. They may not know, understand, uh, 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 how you go about uh, accessing the services and resources that would maybe increase the opportunities for their kids, but in their hearts, they want their children to have a, a better opportunity than they had. How true, how true. So Mary, after you went through uh, grade school, high school, mm -hmm. where, what did you do for uh, advanced education? Well, I went through grade school and I went through high school. I went to Dunbar Vocational High School, Mighty Dunbar, I love that school. Uh, and, and I did what most young ladies do to, today, too many of them, I made really poor decisions, did not go directly to college. In fact, I, I was going to a school at a time where our counselors didn't think that we could do anything uh, special, like go to college. They thought that, you know, because you went to school like Dunbar, you were going to go right out into the workforce. So uh, I took a detour. Uh, I uh, fell in love with someone who, who um, ended up being drafted and went to Vietnam. I uh, ended up having a child uh, at 19 years old and having to go to work, and that's what I did. I used my uh, uh, what I learned at Dunbar as a secretary, shorthand typing, that sort of thing. I used those skills to actually find a job and support uh, myself and my child, uh, and I worked for 20 odd years as a legal secretary in the city of Chicago, going from law firm to law firm, supporting my family. You know, I, I got married. I had uh, other children. I had one other biological child, and I adopted two other children. I did that before I got to the point at 41 years old, deciding I'm not carrying another cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm not writing another memo for somebody else that I'm going back to school, I'm going to get a formal education, I'm going to complete my degree, and I'm going to have a better life for me and my children. So That's you went, happened. excuse me, so you went to school while you were still uh, raising your children? Oh yes, I went to school. I walked in um, the law firm one day and, you know, I just got tired of being passed over for, um, uh, promotions and that's a whole nother story we want to next time I come I'll tell you that one All right. but uh, uh, I decided I'm going back to school full-time and I went to Columbia College I was the oldest student in the classroom uh, people kept confusing me for the teacher they come in and think <laughs> I was teaching the class um, I ended up in 1991 getting an internship uh, at the Chicago Sun Times and, and really um, a former managing editor felt so sorry for me. She thought I had so much gall to walk into the Chicago Sun-Times uh, applying for a job and I never worked for another newspaper before that she was like, well, she had the nerve to do it. We're going to give her the opportunity. And that's how I ended up at the Sun-Times. Oh, that's outstanding. Now, I'm going to ask you more about it, but I'm going to give our, our listeners just a moment to know the uh, call-in number because I suspect there will be some people who have questions for you, Mary. Okay. So there's our number, 312-738-1060. And now, Mary, you, you, let me take you back to that study for just a little bit. How many years were you in college? I went to college, well, you know, over time. I mean, I never stopped going to school. Even when I was working and having children, I would go to it and take at least one class. Okay, I never gave up. So I would take a poetry class or writing class or a sociology mm -hmm. class at night. 
Uh, I went to uh, Wilson, what was then Wilson Junior College, which is now Kennedy King College. I went there at night, so I never gave up. So over a period of time, you could say that I, I went to school probably for 12 years before I came up with a four-year degree. But the point is, I didn't give up. Right. And the point is, even though you, you, you do take a detour, and which is something that I really want young women to understand, you know, just because you... you, you um, take a detour or just because you become a single parent or any other obstacle that's in your life. Maybe you end up uh, in a household where you got to take care of younger brothers and sisters. That does not mean that you cannot regroup. Doesn't mean that you cannot start over. Doesn't mean that you cannot have the opportunity to uh, realize your dreams because that's the trick. You know, people think that just because my life isn't going to where, where I wanted to go, that now it's over for me. And that's just not true. You know, I, and I always say that if I could do it, if I can go back to school under those circumstances, anybody can complete their education. How did your children react to your going back for your degree or continuing to get your degree? Well, my son was interviewed on that. They did a, a, a short little documentary about me. And my son was on that documentary, and he talked about the fact that uh, there were times when I would come home and I would be up like 24 hours because I'd have to take care of my home responsibility and also uh, study. And so I would end up staying up around the clock. He couldn't believe it. But because I received my degree, uh, my, I had two sisters who had not graduated from college. They went on. They received their degree. Wow. Every last one of my children went on to higher education. My son went on to school. My daughter went on and got a higher education. Those things... You know, kids learn by what they see. You can talk to them forever and ever and say, oh, this is the best thing. You need to go to college. You need to get higher education. But if they see that you can provide for your family, uh, working as a secretary or working at the restaurant or whatever it is that you're doing, if they see that you got, you know, the, the, the big screen TV and you've got a car to drive and all those things, they think it's okay. You know, you were able to do it. What you must show them is that, no, it's not okay. You know, you need... You got to make sure that you have something that people can't take away from you, right. and that's your education. And so I think that by even though it was a sacrifice, and I'm not telling anybody out there to do it this way, this is the hard way, not the easy way. You want to go to high school, then you want to go on to college, and then you want to have a career. But if you have to do it this way, but you need to understand that your kids are watching what you do, not what you're, you're saying. They're watching what you do. So you walk into the Sun Times with that degree, and you you get hired by, uh, because you were confident enough uh, and dreaming enough mm -hmm. to uh, do that. What was your early experience with the Sun Times? You were a reporter. I was a reporter. I came in as an intern. Those were in the days when uh, newspapers were uh, able to hire and bring in a group of of uh, journalists as interns. And so at that time, it was six of us. Oh. Uh, I was the oldest one. Um, and that, that worked to my advantage. I really worked that. You know, I, I decided that, okay, I had the experience. And even though they had worked on newspapers before and they knew about deadlines and knew about all those sort of things, I knew about the work, the real work world. And in the real work world, you have to be prepared for anything. You got to get there earlier than anyone else. You got to stay there later than anyone else. You got to make sure that uh, you ask questions and that you're paying attention to everything. You got to dress appropriately. I knew how to do all those things. And so by the, by uh, the end of the summer, I was the intern with the front page stories. And I was the intern that was, you know, partnered up with real seasoned journalists who were teaching me their, you know, tricks of the trade. I, even though I didn't like to rewrite things, I was the one that would, wouldn't mind staying two or three extra hours to write something over or coming in super early. I remember one time I came in and I was working on a, a story and it was just all botched up. Uh, and uh, I came in the newsroom when everyone, in the middle of the night, I went home, I got some sleep, I got up in the middle of the night, I came back in the newsroom because I was determined that when my editor walked in that morning, they would not see a story that was a complete mess. Uh, so those are kind of things you learn from the real work world. Now, I, and I think that that is the reason why at the end of the summer, the Sun-Times asked me to uh, stay on and work on Saturdays and Sundays. That was the first intern that they hired on a part-time basis ever. And what year was that? That was in 1991. All right, so you've been there a few years now, actually, since 1991. I've been there, huh? Yeah, and time went by really quickly. You know, I've had a great time. I've enjoyed every minute of it. 
I've met some interesting people, and it just does not seem like I've been there since 1991. Oh, but your career shows that because you've written a number of prominent and important stories. Uh, could you tell us about a few of those? I know for sure well, I want to ask you about one about women in prison, but... Okay. Well, you know, I, let me just say this, because um, kind of these stories start running all together, and some of the stories I've written have been very controversial, but I, I will define it this way. I'm more of an advocate. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I believe in advocacy journalism. I believe that the newspapers at their very best are used as a platform to help people who are basically either are voiceless uh, in this system uh, th because of the bureaucracy or because of the fact that they are unempowered because of poverty. For a lot of reasons, uh, there are people in this city, in this very city, who are struggling every day and they don't feel like they have a voice or anyone that would listen to them. And that's the, 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 the niche that I found at the Chicago Sun-Times when I came in the newspaper. Nobody was doing that kind of work. I mean, people were either writing about politics or they were writing about uh, race issues or they were writing about, you know, social justice issues. But they weren't really listening to a struggling person who it may be just a mother who wants to get her kid in a charter school and people keep closing the door on her and they, she can't get the kid in the school. You know, those kinds of stories that really touch the heart. And if you write those stories, what I found is that people in Chicago really care. Mm -hmm. You know, I've written stories about, um, I, one of the first stories that I remember was about uh, a senior citizen. She was 84 years old or so, maybe 86 years old, living over in Austin, uh, who was losing her home. This was a paid-for home. This is way before the, the, the uh, foreclosure issue and the uh, mortgage meltdowns. This was way back in 1992 or 93, one of the first stories that I did. And the issue here was that uh, banks and lenders were targeting senior citizens by calling them repeatedly and uh, offering them refinances. That was one problem. The other problem was that uh, the uh, insurance that was supposed to be paid, the mortgage insurance, and the taxes that were supposed to be that senior citizens were paying, when they, when they refinanced that home, somehow the taxes were not being paid and they were not aware that the taxes weren't being paid so the next thing you know here's an aid a woman who's paid off literally paid off her 30-year mortgage got talked into some kind of refinance finance deal to put a roof on her house and then the finance company doesn't pay her taxes and then she's losing her house that story drove me crazy and i i just i just had to i wrote about it and i just laid it out for what it was People were outraged over that story. Um, or the community organizations got involved in it. Uh, uh, Rainbow Push uh, got involved in it. Um, and the next thing I knew, the laws were being changed. The, the uh, Cook County Treasurer's Office was changing the way, number one, they kept up with tax payments so that senior citizens would be aware when their taxes weren't being paid. And number two, uh, we got, we were able to get the person who purchased this woman's house for taxes to back down. And so therefore, this woman was able to stay in her house. Now that to me is the power of journalism. I mean, that to me is more powerful than writing about, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but the President of the United States, there's hundreds of people going to write about the President of the United States and his policies. But how many people are really going to care about an 86-year-old woman who loses her house? Mary Mitchell does. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the little niche that I found uh, in the paper. And one that really, you know, it needs to be filled. That's what newspapers, they're at their best when they're able to investigate and to change policy by the stories that they tell. Now, Mary, if, if we're nurturing children to consider doing what you've done, uh, to follow this kind of career, mm -hmm. sometimes do you get some pushback, some controversy over your stories? Definitely. I mean, I don't think it's a good story. You can't be a, a good reporter uh, a good, or even a good columnist without being controversial. And the reason I say that is because people, few people like to hear the truth. I mean, you know, if there's something that's going on and something that's not uh, uh, that's doing, going undercover, uh, who wants you exposing that? That's number one. And then to take a stand. Whenever you take a stand, in, uh, whether it's in a newspaper or in a uh, legal profession or whatever uh, field you're in, whenever you take a stand, you're coming against the status quo. These are, they're, these are um, 
there are some people who've been doing the same thing forever and ever and ever, you know, and they've benefited from that. I mean, this is the reason why our communities look so bad. I mean, look, think about it. You know, we're living in a city where you have a beautiful downtown and you go over to the south side and they don't even have a grocery store. Mm -hmm. You know, or they don't have uh, a decent uh, playground or they don't have a place where kids can really get activity. My, my grandson, for instance, can go to soccer games and he's on a, a, a basketball team and he has all these activities he can do. There are kids in this city, they don't do anything when they come home but sit down and look at TV. And it's not safe for them to go out in the street. You know, it's not that they don't want to get any exercise, but they don't want to get shot. Sure. So this is the kind of city we live in. And people who are in power and, in, and who have been a part of this system and have created this mess don't want you exposing it. So sometimes you have to be controversial. And, you know, definitely I do get pushback. Letters, you know, lots of, lots of letters you, when you write about uh, issues like race. I mean, race is a real issue in the city of Chicago. We don't want to face that. But again, if you look at the latest census, it shows that African Americans is the largest group of exiting the city. Now, where are people moving out? They're moving out because they want the same thing anybody else wants. They want safe neighborhoods. They want decent housing. Uh, you look at our, our um, city, and after all these years, there's still 26 community groups that are racially segregated, more than 90%. African Americans live in the same areas, whether it's on the west side or whether it's on the on the south side, with a sprinkling throughout the rest of the city. That's our city. And if you don't say anything about that, then I think that, you know, you're failing to do your job. Whatever your job is, whether you think that you are, you know, you're involved in the clergy or you're involved in a newspaper, or you're involved in police work, or you're involved in so social justice work, if you're not confronting that and, and holding that up and saying this is not right, then, then you end up part of the problem. And so you've done this as a reporter. You've um, continued in the role of a columnist. And you are also now uh, and have been on the editorial board for the Chicago Sun-Times as well. Isn't that right, right, since about 1995. And can you tell us what's the difference? How is that role a little bit different than being a columnist? Okay, in a columnist, you get, I get to have, uh, based on my research and based on my analysis, I get to have an opinion. But this is, they clearly understand, my picture is up there, my name is there, it is my column, it is my opinion. Uh, on the editorial board, however, you are a part of a group. And you come in, of uh, the four of us, four or five people, you come in, we sit down, we look at the news of the day, whether we're talking about a social justice policy, we talk about the state budget, maybe it's the Cook County budget, whatever the subject is, we sit down and talk about it and we formulate how we are going to deal with that. What should our position be when it comes to the death penalty? That's a conversation that we have before the whole group. Or who should actually be qualified to run the city of Chicago at taking over from Mayor Daley? Who should actually win the election? We sit down, we interview, we talk about that. So you're part of a decision maker. You have one voice among a lot of voices, you know, the other four uh, people. And it's a, dem uh, a democratic process. You know, there may be two or three uh, different opinions. And so that's another form of advocacy that you have. You have your own column, but you also are part of this group that's pre preparing editorials for the paper. Exactly. For the public. Exactly. And Mary, I see now that we have a caller, so we want to give that caller an opportunity to speak with you. Okay. Good evening, ladies. Good I, evening. I, yes, I was just uh, listening to your comments, and, you know, it, it kind of put me in the mind of what, I guess, the, the term that used to be called white flight from the city and now you're making it sound like it's black fright uh, to have to leave the city for safety you know uh, that, that that seems uh, I don't know kind of ironic uh, even kind of you know kind of scary uh, what will you comment on that okay I'm sorry you said the white flight what were you saying okay well no well let, let me explain that I think that people leave the city of Chicago for the same reasons, black people leave the city of Chicago, the same reason that whites or anyone else leave. And that is, for the most part, they want to live in safe communities, they want their children to go to good schools, mm -hmm. and they want to make sure that they get the best value for their money in terms of, of housing stock. So I wouldn't say that it's so much black fright. I just think that it's people looking for a great opportunity and they want to, they want to make sure they're living in a decent neighborhood. I want to 
thank our caller. And uh, Mary, I'm, I thank you as well. I'm, we have uh, just a short time, a, a few seconds left. What would you like to say to uh, anyone who's trying to help our, our young people dream of moving into uh, service as a reporter, a columnist, uh, using the media for advocacy? Well, first of all, the thing that I would say and, and, and the thing that, that's on my heart is for young women who are maybe facing some obstacles and some challenges in their own lives to understand that, you know, you look around and you think things are rough and you can't be done, but I'm here to tell you that if you keep your mind on it and you're consistent and you don't give up, you can realize your dreams. There's no reason that you cannot. That's the best summary I can think of. Thank you, Mary Mitchell, for being with us and for all the advocacy you do for our children and for our society. Thank you.